You know, 3D scanning has been around for a while and the rate at which that industrial level technology is reaching the consumer level is kind of blown my mind. I mean, we're getting into some Star Trek level stuff here. So we're gonna take a look at uh, Creality's latest Raptor Pro. This is on the expensive end of the consumer level, but what it's able to do really kind of blows my mind. So it has three different scanners built into this. There's a near infrared scanner and you know, that's pretty typical of what you'll have in just about any scanner and it works okay. Um, but you wouldn't buy this just for that. The reason that you get the Raptor Pro is for the blue light lasers. And it has, like the original Raptor, the seven parallel lines, and that works pretty well, but the field of view is really small. And so, you know, if you're trying to scan larger stuff, it takes a long time and you have to put a ton of different markers in, but this one now has uh, in the Pro a 22 line cross-hatched pattern and that is crazy fast and it covers a much larger field of view and saves a ton of prep because you don't need so many markers everywhere to be able to cover your project. So we're gonna try out all those different modes on a few example scans here and then even use some scan data to design a little product. But before that, I had to unpack and calibrate this thing. Let me show you how I did that. So here's the package and inside it was put in a really nice protective case. And I always appreciate that when you're getting something that's somewhat of a precision instrument like this to, to keep it safe and in good condition um, and then have a place for everything to go. So it's a nice touch. Those boxes house all the cables that you'd ever need for uh, various plug adapters. And underneath the uh, foam there is an additional foam insert that has your calibration plate on it. So this has strategically placed markers and you look up the actual serial number of your plate so you can be confident that you're calibrating to that particular plate. And so it walks you through a calibration routine where you have to come at it from different angles and different heights and hit each spot. Now that this is all set up, let's go ahead and take a look at the near infrared mode. Now, like I said before, this isn't the reason that you buy it. I view it more as a bonus uh, in here. So we'll just take a quick look and then we'll get onto the blue lasers. So I'm gonna start off by scanning a bandsaw. Now, one of the benefits of the near infrared mode is that you don't need to put on any kind of targets or markers. Um, but the, the drawback is that it can miss certain, you know, textures or colors. Uh, like that. So this has a lot of different uh, types of colors on it and a lot of different features. So I thought it'd be interesting to see how this portable bandsaw actually scans into there. Now, while I'm scanning, one of the biggest challenges is to maintain tracking and it has to mathematically uh, follow along with this geometry. And sometimes it would get lost like that, but it would find itself once again. So this isn't the absolute best near infrared scanner I've used, but in the end, it's still really uh, cool to be able to take an object and make a scan like that. And obviously there's plenty of usable geometry here. Um, I wanted to look at a contour. Now, if you have completely flat faces, sometimes it'll just run away like all of them do, but this has a slight contour to it, similar to an auto body panel, what it might if you're trying to match it with a bumper. So I thought this would be an interesting example scan that I could show here in the shop, the side of this generator and it worked out pretty well. It was able to follow and track along. It had just enough curvature to it to be able to keep track of where it was. And after I uh, went over it again and again, I got pretty good uh, scan data there on the side on that blue panel, um, but it didn't pick up the black plastic panel on the back. And so if I wanted to pick that up, I'd need to use some kind of a scanning spray, like a white powder spray, a lot of people use like that foot spray from a pharmacy or whatever, and uh, that can give you just a different texture to be able to pick up. But overall, still pretty cool given that I did no prep to this at all. All right, so you can see how that'd be useful if you didn't want to go to any prep, or you might use that mode to scan faces or bodies if you're into the figurines or whatever you want to do with that. Um, but let's get on to the blue light laser mode and see what we can do with this. So let's start off by scanning uh, the same object using both the seven parallel lines and the 22 line crosshatched pattern. So I'm using this smaller lathe chuck and I'm gonna scan it with both the seven line and 22 line methods. And then I'm going to actually check the scan data and compare that to the real diameter of the chuck using both methods. 
I need to prep it with a lot of these targets. And I stuck those little magnetic towers that I'd 3D printed earlier um, on the table around it. And that just gives me something else to look at uh, here with the scanner and, and help keep tracking around this thing. So I'll follow around it, uh, and I'm relatively close to this to be able to scan with the seven lines like this. And you can see it starts to pick it up right away. There's not a lot of tracking issue when it's working to the markers like this. So I can just follow around and get a, a pretty good representation. But I do have a small field of view here, so it takes a bit longer to work my way around. And the markers have to be fairly dense to be able to pick them up. Now after I've got some scan data, I want to clean it up a little bit and just delete the portions that I don't need. So I can just trim away at it until I get uh, what I want. And then I'll use their one-click processing. I never changed any uh, post-processing parameters. I just used their automatic mode. And I got this result, which looks really nice. We'll export it and uh, measure it later to see how it compares to reality but definitely usable for these smaller parts. But I wanna try it with the 22 uh, crosshatch lines here. So with the 22 line laser, I've noticed how much further back I am and it's picking up a huge area. And so as soon as I start scanning with this, I mean, it picks it up. Let's just look from the beginning. So as I start right now, look how much it's picked up immediately. This is in real time. And as it turns green, then you have enough scan data to reconstruct from uh, with a high level of confidence. So it's already, you know, basically done after I work through for that short period of time. And I can once again trim that uh, data down. I mean, even look around the outside, how much of my welding table it picked up. And it has the lines in between and the holes and everything right in place. So it picked up a lot uh, with that. And then... The scan honestly looks pretty similar uh, in this case, but it was much faster uh, to achieve. So let's compare this to the actual diameter. So this is measuring just a touch over 100 millimeters with calipers. Um, somebody's commenting right now that a mic would be more accurate, and that's true, but I'm doing this today. Now I can fit a cylinder to the outer diameter and compare here uh, the deviation. So its maximum deviation is about a tenth of a millimeter, so that means that my cylinder picked up you know, pretty smoothly. And when I look at the diameter, it's oversized by about a tenth of a millimeter, which is you know four or five thousandths of an inch. And uh, that's like the diameter of a human hair. So when you consider this was picked up with a fancy blue flashlight, that's pretty impressive right here. Um, but uh, it did take a bit longer. Now let's look here with 22 lines and do the same thing. So I'll import this and then fit a cylinder to the outside. And the max deviation, once again, is about a tenth of a millimeter. So it did fill in pretty smoothly. And if I check the diameter of that uh, cylinder there that was the best fit statistically, uh, once again, it's about a tenth of a millimeter over, um, which is somewhere around the diameter of a human hair. So pretty impressive, uh, if you ask me, for a consumer level scanner. Um, it is at the high end of the consumer level, but uh, with this cross-hatching, and that is fast and accurate. 22 lines, uh, that was a lot faster. Let's go ahead and try that out on a little bit larger, kind of a medium-sized object here. All right, so I'm gonna scan this bench vise here because not only does it have a lot of intricate shapes, it has bare metal, a shiny finish, and some black on it. All three of those things can be difficult to scan. And so the only prep I've done here is adding the markers. And this is in real time. Look how quickly that emerges. And as it turns green, that means I've got all the data that I need for a good quality scan. Now when scanning, you can choose how long to spend on each area to get the fidelity that you need for your intended use, right? So you might spend a lot of time on a small area or you might spend you know, a short amount of time because you just need a basic volume. So you can really tailor it to your use case, but uh, I'm getting a pretty impressive model that's capturing all of those different textures uh, here in place. Now there are a couple of holes that I could have spent a little longer on, but look at the detail that you have. And I mean, even look at the welds on there, the welded features. Um, you could really uh, take a record of, you know, all sorts of weld inspection with this. That would be an interesting thing to look into. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're just looking to interface with something, that's an incredible level of detail, in my opinion, for a consumer level scanner.
So the real beauty of 3D scanning for me is to be able to design products that interface with other parts, whether that's uh, fabricated products or you know 3D printed ones. Um, I wanna start off with a simple example here. So I'm gonna go ahead and scan the body of my tungsten grinder. So this is like a fancy pencil sharpener that I use to sharpen tungsten electrodes for TIG welding. And I wanna keep it right uh, at hand on my welding table. And you could try to do some fancy tricks to measure this around here, but if I could just take this geometry and scan it in and then build something around it that this can sit in, that'd be really nice. So let's go ahead and grab some scan data, model something around that in the computer, 3D print it and see how that works. So I'm scanning this uh, here on its side and I'm prepping it with some uh, markers and I also have those different uh, pyramids that I'd 3D printed. Now I could have stood this up on end to scan around the whole outside of the handle, but I didn't because honestly I didn't think about it and I can assume that it's symmetric. So I'm really just going to use half of it and mirror this over. Now this is in real time. You can see how quickly it's picking it up uh, here in my scan data using those 22 crosshatched lines. And so this is less than a minute to pick up all the geometry that I'm going to need to work with here in the uh, actual part. Now I'll trim off the front end because I'm not going to interface with that. And honestly, I could trim off a little bit more to make the model smaller, but I'll just leave it as is because it's not huge uh, anyway, at least for the computer that I'm using. So I can export this out as a point cloud. Um, and there are a bunch of different file formats you can choose from, but uh, I'll just use, uh, I think I ended up turning it into an SDL here to bring it in. But either way, you can see how the geometry came into Fusion 360 right there. And then I was able to model around that surface to create my part. All right, well, here's the finished product. Um, I have my holster right here and it has a slot so the cord can go through and it can drop right here with a spot for the switch. And then it has a couple pegs underneath that can engage right here with my welding table. If I can line that up, there you go. And then it's right at hand. So that worked out really well. So overall, uh, my impressions of the scanner performance, the 22 line laser mode, that's how I'm gonna use this. It just plain works. You don't have to do nearly as much prep with the markers. The seven line could be handy if I'm working with some small intricate feature. Uh, but I'll probably use that a little bit less than that 22 line laser mode. The near infrared mode, in my opinion, is just something that you might consider a bonus, um, that you're getting a blue light laser scanner, and it'd be nice to have this once in a while for different things. Honestly, it's not the best performing that I've used on the near infrared side uh, because of some of the tracking errors that we saw as we were working through the scanning. Um, that said, it still was totally capable of getting a scan. So thanks a ton for tuning in. If you want to check this out and see the full details and specs or pick one up, there's a link in the description. We'll see you next time.